Can the virus live on various surfaces? I was wondering about masks. Do you have any suggestions for small business owners? How are they disposing virus items? What about the pages of the newspaper? Is there a safe way to handle money when Do we have a local estimated time for reopening business? You have questions and we have answers. Welcome to our News 8 Special Edition. We're in this together answering your questions. I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. During the next hour, we hope to answer many of the questions we've been getting from viewers about coronavirus. And you still have a chance to ask a question by going directly to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash News 8. Our Shannon Handy will be along shortly with that. First, we would like to introduce you to our special guest this evening. We have Dr. Philly Fentides, who will be answering questions. He is Urgent Care Medical Director for the Sharp Reese Steely Group. And we have County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. Welcome to both of you, and thank you for joining us tonight. Yeah, starting us off will be Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. We want to thank you for making time. We know you've been very busy with your daily updates. Appreciate it greatly. We're getting a lot of questions, you can imagine, some specifically about the stimulus payment. People want to know, They've heard that they have to pay the stimulus money back on next year's taxes. Is that a question you can help us out with? Yeah, that's definitely a federal issue, uh, but you, you don't have to pay the stimulus back. The stimulus funds are designed to uh, help folks get through this period of difficulty, get through this period of uncertainty, uh, help prop up an economy that, that we know is suffering. Uh, and so there, there's no part of the stimulus uh, payments that if individuals receive that they, they, they won't have any obligation to pay that money back. All right, that's just a point of confusion for some people. The big question that I get the most from people is, so what's next? What's happening next? Uh, what is the strategy going to be for moving forward? The governor spoke about a framework for easing stay at home restrictions. Right. Can you talk about that for our viewers uh, who may have missed that? Yeah, I think I think what's really important to keep in mind is, as we think about this is is the notion of, of going back to normal. Um, in order to be able to go back to normal, we, we would have to have herd immunity, which which means that the overwhelming majority of folks um, are, are immune from catching it. And the reality is we are unlikely to get to a point of herd immunity short of a vaccine, uh, which is going to take some time. And so I think it's important that we all really think about uh, how, how do we begin to get back to a new normal or how do we begin uh, to turn the dial a little bit. If, if you think about as we went into this, we started with the public health order, we started with guidance, we banned mass gatherings of 250, and we gradually turned that dial. Uh, what we're likely to see when we come out of this is a gradual unturning of the dial, a pause to see what the impact is. Uh, you know, Singapore was widely praised for their incredible early response. Uh, they undid things too fast, and now their cases are skyrocketing, and they're having to ratchet back down. We, we want to try and avoid that. What we want to try and do is, is slowly come out of this, and we're not there yet, but we're preparing, slowly come out of this in a way uh, that preserves the integrity of the healthcare system. Um, but as the governor alluded to, uh, you are unlikely to see 45,000 people uh, in Petco Park watching a baseball game or at a concert any time this year. We're likely to come out of this into a new normal uh, that begins to, to get back a little bit back to normal. Uh, but the reality is that the nature of coronavirus, the lack of a vaccine, the lack of a uh, medical treatment, um, you know, means that we're going to be in some state of responding to this for a while. Uh, it doesn't mean things won't get better. It just means it's, it's we have to reset our, our expectations a little bit, um, understanding the nature. Uh, what the governor outlined were kind of six key thresholds that we have to meet uh, in order to begin to come out of it. The availability of not only mass, t mass testing, but the ability to trace and isolate anyone who's positive, specific plans for the vulnerable, reimagining businesses and schools and, and what that will look like, um, and a series of other steps that we have to do. And we are working every single day uh, to answer those six areas, to develop plans, to assess our infrastructure, and to be in a position um, once we think it is appropriate to begin to take those initial steps. Up one of those components, which is critical, and there's a lot of controversy about. We had a pop-up testing station go up in Miracosta that is being shut down by the county now. Pe people want to know when will they be able to get tested for themselves? When will there be widespread testing to find out if people are asymptomatic or whether they've had it already? Well, and I wish I could tell you. Uh, one of the most frustrating things of, of going through this is there's just so many things that. Uh, we just don't know, and I think we've tried to be very transparent with the public from a public health standpoint about, look, this is what we know and, and this is what we don't know. 
Uh, we know that we are seeing an increase in testing. Uh, we're seeing an increase in testing in both the PCR, the, the kind of test that we're used to seeing, and we're seeing progress being made on, on the more uh, serology-based testing uh, that can do in a different way. Uh, but the reality is you have an entire planet that is all fighting for the same limited capacity of testing. And while you have a lot of labs and a lot of commercial resources and folks ramping up that capacity, uh, we have to continue to fight. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a story out that San Diego County was doing better than most other counties in terms of testing per 10,000 residents. We want that to continue, but it's really important uh, that, that, that if you get a test, you have to feel confident that it is, it is a good test. Uh, that it, is, it has been evaluated, it has been approved, uh, and we have to be really mindful in these difficult periods of individuals uh, popping up, maybe taking advantage of the situation, uh, who, who are not properly trained or, or verified in order to do it. And so we're fighting every day to get more testing. Uh, we're beginning to see increases, and we're beginning to see on the horizon some, some significant increases in the availability of testing. Uh, but we've, we've got to just be patient as, as we get out there and fight for more. And, and we're going to continue to do everything we can to get every valid and viable test deployed in San Diego County, but it's got to be valid and viable. Yeah, huge logistic hurdles to getting to that. Supervisor Fletcher, we're going to check back within, with you in a little bit later in our newscast, so don't go anywhere, okay? Perfect. Since the start of this pandemic, we've gotten a lot of guidance from federal, state, and local governments. That leads to our web poll question. Who are you most confident in for leadership during this crisis, federal, state, or local government? To take part, you can go to cbs8.com slash vote, or you can use the News 8 app right now. Uh, the, the level of government giving you the most confidence is the state government at 81%, but we'll update that. We just got that going. We'll update it a little bit later on. When we come back, more of your questions for our special guests and everything you need to know about filing for unemployment. Don't go away. Baker's number one priority is the health and safety. hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. But the question a lot of people want to know is why? Why 20 seconds? Here's why. Take a close look at soap and you'll see it's made up of molecules with two different ends. One side loves water, the other loves fat. Use soap and water on oil, for example, and the soap molecules go to work. The water-loving side goes toward water. The fat-loving side breaks down the oil. That's why it cleans your dirty dishes so well. 
But how does it work on the coronavirus, which is named after these crown-like spikes? These allow the virus to attach to your lung cells, causing major damage. But the outer layer of the virus has a weakness, the fat-loving side of the soap molecule. See that, that outer layer? Scientists call it a membrane of oily lipid molecules. That outer layer is no match for soap. Each one pries the membrane apart, exposing the water-soluble inside of the virus to, yes, water. Eventually, soap forms a bubble around the bad stuff. Scientists call it a micelle. Add more water and it all washes away. So why 20 seconds? Your hands have a bunch of lines, which viruses like to hide in. More soap time, more time to clean those cracks. So get going and start counting. One, two, three, 20 seconds should do the trick. Good description. Joining us now over the phone is Dr. Philly Fentides, who is the urgent care director with the Sharpreys Steely Group. And we have a question for him tonight. Thank you for joining us. First of all, Dr. E. Fentides. Our first question comes from San Diego and Tim Fojek, and he has recorded it and sent it in. So let's take a listen to what he has to ask you. Regarding the virus, many of us are following the rules, including for social distancing. Does this mean that our reward at the end of the stay at home period will be that we become a significant target for the virus going forward? Because we likely have no immunity to it. So that's the question. A lot of our questions actually have to do with immunity, and he's concerned, I guess, that he's not building any immunity to it, he and other people who are following all the guidelines right now. Is that really going to happen? Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, flattening the curve does prolong the period of time we will see cases in the local area, yet it is the most effective way to limit the number of cases and the number of unnecessary deaths. It's estimated that the vast majority of San Diego is still vulnerable, and we don't have widespread immunity yet. Um, but an analogy of thinking about this is we're on the battlefield. We're hunkered down in a trench with no weapon. As long as we're in the trench, there's bullets flying overhead, and we're in the safety of the trench, and we can stay hunkered down for a while. But we have no defense against this virus. Since it's a novel virus, we've never seen it infect humans before, and we don't yet have a vaccine. San Diego is one of the most prepared large metropolitan areas in America with the COVID response we've uh, instituted thus far. Uh, we instituted the stay-at-home order. As you know, March 16 went into effect on St. Patrick's Day, March 17. We don't have widespread immunity yet, um, but we eventually will. But the whole point of lowering this curve is to prevent a surge in cases and rapid proliferation of new cases, which will result in unnecessary uh, loss of life. So what's happening in other metropolitan areas is not what we want to happen here, and thus far we've been successful. Here we are, four and a half, almost five weeks into the local spread, we still haven't seen a surge. So uh, our goal is to hopefully get our population closer to the institution of a vaccine that will actually work, and if we can do that, we will save thousands, if not tens of thousands of lives uh, with, the, with what we're doing now. So this notion of individual immunity and somebody staying at home, one person following all the rules, perhaps not exposing themselves to anything, they're not going to have a weaker immune system than anyone else who is out there maybe not following these guidelines then? No. By staying home and avoiding exposure to the virus, they're avoiding the 2 to 3, maybe 3% 3 chance of death. They're avoiding the 20% uh, chance of hospitalization, and they're avoiding the 5 to 8% chance of being in the ICU on life support. So that's the goal, and thus far in the San Diego metropolitan area, we've done remarkably well. Still the best advice. Some people are wondering when we give out the numbers every day of the new confirmed cases, and they're wondering about the number of people being tested. Do you happen to know what percentage of people being tested are coming back positive? I do. So out of tw over 27,000 tests in the county, 1,930 uh, tested positive as of the numbers that came out uh, yesterday. And that's a 7% positive rate. 
at my own clinics at Sharp Reese Daily Medical Group, we've tested about 1,200 patients, and we've had 135 of our patients test positive, which is about an 11% positive rate. So still the vast majority of illness causing fever and upper respiratory symptoms is not COVID. And that's why we don't have widespread immunity, and that's why, as, Dr., uh, as uh, Supervisor Fletcher mentioned, we are, are looking to implement the serology antibody testing, but that testing doesn't have much utility yet because so few San Diegans have actually had COVID. It will have great utility as we have much more disease burden locally. All right, Dr. Ifantidis, thank you. We do have many more questions for you, so we will keep you on the line. Thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you again in just a few moments. You know, many San Diegans are struggling right now, and filing for unemployment is not easy, as so many people have brought to our attention. Yeah, a lot of challenges. One News 8 viewer asks how long the unemployment application process takes from start to finish. News 8's Monique Griego got some answers that you're looking for. We know right now there are a lot of people that need to file for unemployment and are having issues or just a lot of questions. So we wanted to speak to people to try to get you any information that could help you through that process. As the coronavirus, aka COVID-19, continues to force tens of thousands of San Diegans and people across the country to apply for unemployment benefits, the system for many is proving to be frustrating. The site's crashing or that they're overwhelmed because they don't know exactly how to apply. So we've been uh, sending out information through Facebook and our email blast through the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce uh, to provide that information to the general public and as well as our membership. Iris Garcia is the president and CEO of the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Even though we all know that there's not many job opportunities out there right now, uh, many people can't find work and we all know it's due to the pandemic. It's an issue affecting people across the board, communities struggling to navigate the system to get assistance and make ends meet. And sometimes the assistance programs can be complicated. Ricardo Villa is Garcia's vice chair and also owns a payroll company. So it's become more complex and there's a lot of questions happening at the same time and trying to get them pointed in the right directions. The employer and the employees, you know, the employer not sure what they're supposed to be doing uh, or if they're supposed to be doing anything. Both say people need to be aware of what they qualify for and how to get ready for the process. If you can, get a letter uh, from your employer regarding your unemployment status and then uh, or your reduction of hours. So you can also apply for a reduction of hours for unemployment. Still keep up with your application and checking on it every single week and putting down that you are actively looking for work. And while sometimes overwhelming, both say it's important to fight for the benefits you're entitled to. Don't give up. Make sure you're fighting for your family. Make sure you're fighting for what you've already paid into the system and make sure that you're getting those benefits. Don't allow a crash site to uh, discourage you. And we did put up some sites that we think may be helpful for you on our website. Just go to CBS8.com or click on the hot button. Monique Riego, News 8. Got to be persistent there. All right, we're going to welcome back Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. A few more questions. This one, Nathan, uh, somebody tells us, I walked past a San Diego fire station and saw three firemen in uniform working within two to four feet of one another on an emergency vehicle in the driveway. None of them were ma wearing masks. Aren't they supposed to be wearing masks? Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, there, there is uh, at times kind of uncertainty. We know that there's been a lot of orders. There, there, there is a lot to digest. Uh, our public health orders are a strong encouragement for everyone when they leave their home, uh, whether they're going to an essential job uh, or they're going to an essential service. It is an encouragement that they wear a mask, um, but it is just that as an encouragement. It is not a, it is not a requirement. Uh, we do have a handful of categories of, of, of uh, entities where it is required that the employees wear a mask. These are things like grocery stores, banks, convenience stores, pharmacies, gas stations. Um, there, there are a handful of others, transit centers, um, transit uh, operators, where the employees are required to wear a mask, uh, but that is, that is not a requirement for our first responders. Um, it is an encouragement, and we encourage them to do it when they can. In terms of the, the physical distancing, we, we strongly encourage that in essential businesses, but the reality is there are some essential businesses that just as a matter of practice cannot always maintain six feet physical separation. 
Uh, if you're in a hospital and your doctor is operating on you, of course, it's impractical for the doctor to be six feet away. Uh, if you're a firefighter and you're responding to a call and, and you have your fellow firefighter right there beside you and you're working on an issue, uh, it may not be practical for them to achieve that. Um, and so, again, the, the face coverings are a strong recommendation for everyone when you leave your home. Uh, and for those seven uh, business entities, uh, some of which I listed off, it is a requirement for the employees. Um, and, and again, the, the face covering primarily serves the role of, of you may be positive and not know, and that can help stop you from spreading it. So it's protecting others, uh, provides some protection from you gaining it, but primarily it's to protect uh, you from other folks. All right, hence uh, Chairperson uh, Cox's if you leave your place, cover your face. We'll check back cover with you. Cover your face. Yeah, yeah, right. There you go. We'll check back with you in a few. Thanks. And there is much more ahead tonight with Dr. Ethan Tides and Supervisor Fletcher. We're also keeping an eye on your questions that are coming in right now on our Facebook Live. I'm Shannon Handy, live from my house. I'm monitoring our Facebook page right now. You can go to the CBA State Facebook page and ask questions, and we will try to get our experts to answer them. We'll have that coming up. Hey, San Diego. Springs blooming at Evergreen Nursery. Let their experts help plan your garden. Welcome back. Some of you watching this special right now on Facebook Live have questions of your own. News A's Shannon Handy is following those, and she joins us now live with a question for Dr. Ethan Tides. Shannon? Thanks, Barbara Lee and Carlo. Yeah, I'm here at my house, and I've been monitoring the Facebook page. And again, you can still chime in. Just go to Facebook and search for CBS 8. Now, Dr. Ethan Tides, one of the questions we received was from Philip Aguilar. He says, why is the making of a coronavirus vaccine so slow? Um, I totally understand the question, and it's, it, it's an astute question. Um, it is actually uh, slow maybe compared to what uh, some folks are used to with new products coming to market. But in terms of vaccine and drug development, having a, uh, we're hopeful to have a coronavirus vaccine available for widespread use in early 2021, just about 9 to 11 months away. That's actually lightning fast 
for a medical intervention. Normally, medical interventions must go through several phases of clinical trials. It's a multi-year process, sometimes can take up to five to seven years. So for us to actually uh, have something like a vaccine for widespread population use on hundreds of millions of people, uh, not only in this nation, but worldwide, is a lightning fast proposition to have that uh, launched within one year. The FDA has fast-tracked this research. There are several research uh, institutions around the, na uh, the nation, but also the world, all working on uh, verifying and vetting vaccine uh, uh, particles of this virus that will be effective in achieving an, an immune response. But you can imagine, you once you create the vaccine, you have to use it on healthy individuals, and then you have to see if it actually generates a an antibody response. Not only that, you have to then see if those antibodies that are generated are actually effective against the COVID virus itself because the, the, the virus has different particles, protein particles that you can uh, uh, target and a vaccine, an effective vaccine targets a very sensitive part of the, vac of the virus that enables the, the vaccine to generate an immune response in the host that will protect the host from the real infection. So really getting that out within one year is quite an amazing feat and something that we have not seen done in uh, recent history. Okay, thank you so much for that explanation. I know a lot of people were curious about that. We will let you go for now, but we'll have you stay on the line to answer some more questions later. And for now, I'll send it back to you guys in the studio. Thanks, Shannon. Thanks, Dr. Infantides. Our We're In This Together special continues with more of your questions. It's coming up next. I'm Marcella Lee. A lot of people are wearing gloves when they go out, but a common question we're hearing is, do gloves really help protect us from the coronavirus? When you wear gloves to the grocery store to pump gas or grab your mail, you might be lulled into a false sense of security. But there's one big problem, cross-contamination. Doctors say viruses can live on gloves. So if you touch a grocery cart that's contaminated, for instance, you can spread it to the next thing you touch, like your cell phone. Hold that up to your face and you've exposed yourself to the coronavirus. Doctors say gloves will not help if you're not going to change your habits. Also, there's a specific way to peel off your gloves so they end up inside out to prevent germs from getting on your hands. Make sure you throw your gloves directly in the trash. And this is important. Immediately wash your hands, use a disinfectant wipe or hand sanitizer just in case your gloves had a small tear or you exposed yourself to the virus while removing them. facing challenges during these difficult times.
eye protection in a Can the pet carry the coronavirus? It'll get mail, but how should we handle what that? What else will disinfect the virus? And welcome back to our News 8 special. We're in this together. Your questions answered. I'm Barbara Lee Edwards. I'm Carlo Cicchetto. You still have a chance to ask your question by going directly to our Facebook page at facebook.com slash news8. Our Shannon Handy will be along shortly with those questions. We are going to continue our questions now. This one is for Dr. Ethan Tedes, and it is from Brian Jones. He says it has to do with people approaching you when you're out walking your dog. Listen. As that dog approaches someone else, the others often pet the dog in an attempt to make friendly with the people and the dog. And then if they are asymptomatic or sick, possibly transfer the virus to the coat of that animal. My question to you, is that something we should worry about? Yes, uh, thanks for that question. And the answer is yes, that is something you should worry about. Um, someone who has the viral infection, if they touch their eyes, nose, or mouth, uh, they can certainly uh, transmit that infection onto your pet. And if you then touch your pet after they've touched the pet, yes, absolutely. And a, a related question that often comes up is, uh, are dogs susceptible to coronavirus? There have been some case reports worldwide that some dogs and even cats have been infected with coronavirus, but it's an extremely rare situation. Uh, now, there was the report of a, a large cat, a tiger, at the New York uh, Bronx Zoo with respiratory symptoms that uh, uh, tested positive for coronavirus, and it's thought that that tiger got the infection from uh, one of the workers there that was also uh, positive for the virus. But the recommendation is just like we maintain social distancing of at least six feet from others, uh, we should be doing the same with our pets. And I think it's reasonable if you're out on a walk and you're going to be crossing paths with another uh, uh, neighbor or uh, with or without a pet, uh, a dog that they're walking, that you cross the street, that you maintain social distancing, and in a nice way possible, uh, in a neighborly way, let your neighbor know, hey, uh, let's maintain our distance and keep each other safe, and it's reasonable to not let others pet your dog, and that way uh, your animals and you can uh, maintain safety and not risk catching the infection on a, on a pleasant walk in your neighborhood. Absolutely. So your dog is another surface that can still pick up the germ, and it is an extension of you if you're out walking. Carry the same rules with the dog. Now, somebody else asked if the main reason that COVID-19 kills people is that it causes pneumonia. People are wondering, does it lessen the effect of the risk at all if you've had a pneumonia shot? Uh, excellent question, uh, Barbara Lee. The pneumonia shot that they're referring to is an, a vaccine that's specific for streptococcus pneumonia, uh, which is a bacteria and uh, has been, used to be the most common cause of uh, community-acquired pneumonia in the United States. Since that vaccine has been instituted, we are seeing many less cases of streptococcus pneumonia, that bacteria. So having had that vaccine to protect you from that bacteria does nothing at all to protect you from coronavirus and from catching coronavirus pneumonia. It's an excellent question, but the vaccine is for a different uh, pathogen. In that case, it's the bacteria streptococcus pneumonia. So the, the one message we are driving home to people here is this is just something completely different that we don't have a cure for or a vaccine for yet, and everybody just needs to be extra vigilant because of that. That's correct. All right, Dr. Ifantides, don't go away. We'll have more questions for you shortly, and thank you for answering those. Back to County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher for our next question. Viewers seen footage of streets being disinfected or sprayed in other countries and wonders why we're not doing that here in San Diego, Supervisor. 
Thank you uh, for the question. We're looking at every option for everything we can do uh, to respond to this, both from, from personal hygiene, from hygiene of buildings, certainly to hygiene of our streets and other things. Uh, the County Department of Environmental Health uh, outlines the procedures uh, that, that jurisdictions can follow and should follow um, as it relates to disinfecting surfaces. Um, and, and I think we've seen our Department of Environmental Health really respond creatively, uh, looking for everything that we might do to protect the public. And we'll continue to, to look for those opportunities and look for more things that we need to do uh, in order to best protect the public. Uh, but again, to, to reiterate, the best thing you can do um, are, are the, to protect yourself for the things that we've been outlined, the things that Dr. Infantiti's talked about. Uh, it is that stay home. Uh, if you have to leave, ensure physical distancing. And, you know, just to follow up, Dr. Infantiti's made a great point that there's any number of surfaces where coronavirus may live, and if your hand touches it and it's there, then you may come in contact with it. But as long as you don't touch your mouth, your eyes, or your nose before you wash your hands for 20 seconds, uh, you will be okay. And so we'll keep looking for every opportunity to disinfect everything we can. Uh, but the most important thing is a decision each and every one of us make uh, about disinfecting our own hands and coming up with your own routine and your own song or poem or whatever it is you do to, to get to that 20 second threshold. And you've brought that message home many times. That along with the assumption that your neighbors, everyone around you, assume all of them have the virus and are carrying it. If you want to keep yourself safe, behave as such, correct? Exactly right. And, and, and if you go in, in, in that mindset, and you can still be friendly to folks yeah. uh, from six feet away, you can still wave at folks and still say hello, um, but it is really adopting that mindset. And, you know, something that, that is really incredible is so often we give public health advice about what folks should do uh, to improve their own public health. And, you know, sometimes we get adherence to those and sometimes we don't. Uh, but in this, in this instance, we've seen San Diegans respond across the board. Uh, people have made tremendous sacrifice, they've made a tremendous commitment, um, and, and they've made a commitment because their actions impact others. You know, as we each choose to, to adhere to these guidance and, and as we choose in our family units to do the same, it's not just your own life you're saving, it's the life of someone else. Uh, and so it's been really encouraging to see our community come together. One of the reasons that San Diego has, has had so much initial success in flattening the curve, and I want to caution that by saying initial success. Uh, because the coronavirus is just as contagious tomorrow as it was a month ago. And so we can't lessen our posture today, but we've seen so much initial success because San Diegans have truly bought in out of a desire to help one another. Yeah. Um, and it, it's really struck me that in San Diego, the coronavirus is not the only thing that is contagious, a spirit of community, a spirit of compassion, a spirit of looking out for one another, uh, a spirit of reaching out to each other during this difficult time. And it is very, very difficult for so many folks uh, that is contagious, and that's what's going to really help us get through this together. All right. As we like to say around here, we're in this together. Supervisor Fletcher, we'll be we're back in, in a together. few with you. Since the start of this pandemic, we've received a lot of guidance from federal, state, and local government. Tonight's web poll, who are you most confident in for leadership during this crisis? Federal, state, or local governments? Those results so far, 17% trust the federal government most. 74% trust the state government the most. 9% look to the local government. Please stay with us. More of your questions are straight ahead. I'm monitoring our Facebook page live from home. If you have a question you'd like answered, just go to Facebook and search for CBS 8. We'll try to get that question answered from one of our experts. We'll have that coming up. Just go to 2020census.gov.
Welcome back. Many of you watching our special tonight on Facebook Live are asking questions of your own. News A. Shannon Handy has been keeping an eye on those questions for us tonight. She joins us now live with a question for County Supervisor Nathan Fletcher. Shannon. Thanks, Beverly and Carlo. A lot of people are chiming in, so we thank our viewers for that. Supervisor Fletcher, Kathy Carrico asks, question for Supervisor Fletcher. If we encounter a homeless person, who should we contact? Yeah, thank you for that question. We have, uh, in, in, in some ways, struggled a little bit uh, when it comes to the challenge of, of homelessness. We uh, had a homeless challenge, an affordable housing challenge crisis, you might say, before we put a global pandemic on top of that. Uh, and dealing with the global pandemic has not made the challenge of, of homelessness any easier. Uh, we have moved rapidly to get public health nurses with homeless outreach teams looking for symptoms to have public health uh, motel rooms available for those who need it, uh, hundreds of rooms for the regional task force on homeless uh, to put individuals in, and then of course the incredible work and effort of the convention center. Um, if you encounter someone on the street, the, the best advice that we can give you and the best recommendation we can make um, is to have them contact any of the homeless service providers who are out there. Uh, in each region of the county, there's a number of different ones who are there, and they are best positioned uh, to help get that individual into a sheltering environment. Uh, we think that there's tremendous potential. The convention center initially was there to provide physical distancing for our existing shelters, but they are now beginning to take folks uh, who are unsheltered uh, into the convention center to get options, uh, and there's an array of other options. And so the regional task force on the homeless uh, has really been the coordinating entity for that effort. Uh, our focus at the county has been protecting the public health. Uh, to date, we're fortunate we've only had 14 uh, unsheltered individuals test positive. Uh, each of those individuals is getting care either at a county public health motel room, uh, which includes the, the food and the laundry and the sanitation along with daily wellness checks. Uh, a couple have been in the hospital um, and they will go to our public health rooms when they come out. Uh, but the coronavirus attacks particularly hard our vulnerable populations, our seniors, uh, folks with respiratory illness, uh, obviously uh, folks uh, who have inequities in, in broader health care coverage, um, and that definitely includes the homeless. And so we've really tried to do a lot to address that. Uh, but I think the issue of homelessness is one that transcends and is even bigger than coronavirus. Uh, and frankly, we have to do a better job, uh, and we have to provide more services, and we have to provide more options and provide more help. Uh, and it would be my hope that we can continue to do that. All right, thank you so much, Supervisor Fletcher. Again, lots of questions coming in. If we don't get to them during this special hour, we will monitor this page and try to answer those questions in the upcoming days on News 8. But for now, we'll send it back to you guys in the studio. All right, thanks, Shannon. And we will have more of your questions answered when News 8 special We're In This Together continues. I'm Marcella Lee. One of the common questions we're getting is, should we wipe down our groceries or fresh produce? While there's been no evidence so far that the coronavirus is transmitted through food, new research shows it can survive on glass for three days and plastic and stainless steel for six days. Scientists also believe it can survive in your refrigerator for weeks and your freezer for years. Michigan Dr. Jeffrey Van Wingen says those who want to be extra cautious can disinfect their groceries before putting them away. Here's how. Divide your counter into a dirty and clean side, placing all of your groceries on the dirty side. Spray a household cleaner onto a paper towel or use a cleaning wipe to wipe down plastic packaging, canned goods, bottles and jars one by one, then place them on the clean side. For items like frozen pizza or cereal that have a sealed bag inside, he suggests sliding out that bag onto the clean side and disposing of the outer box. You can also empty items into your own containers. For fruits and vegetables, multiple health experts advise rinsing them in cold running water for 20 to 30 seconds and rubbing or scrubbing the outside surfaces with your hands or a brush. Disinfect the dirty side of the counter and wipe down the faucet and anything else you might have touched. Then, and this is important, wash your hands with soap and water for 20 seconds. It's the Anderson brand BOGO sale time. Need a new heating and cooling system?
back to our We're In This Together. Your questions answered. Our News 8 special tonight. We have another question for Dr. Philly Fentides, who is the Urgent Care Medical Director for the Sharpreys Steely Medical Group. One viewer asks, and a few people have said this, I think I might have had the virus in February. Should I be tested now to confirm? And if I did have it, can my blood or antibodies help anyone? That's an excellent question. I'm so happy that uh, a viewer brought that up. The answer is yes, you could be very helpful. Uh, the National Institutes of Health and the Red Cross are currently running research studies on use of antibodies from patients who recovered from COVID-19 to see if these would be helpful in the treatment of hospitalized patients with severe COVID infection. This is called use of, quote, convalescent serum. Uh, the San Diego Blood Bank locally is accepting plasma donations from those who have recovered from COVID for this purpose. And for those interested, they can go to the San Diego Blood Bank org and click on the COVID-19 uh, update link there for more information. It's fine if you don't have a positive uh, COVID test that confirmed the COVID infection, but if you were sick for a couple of weeks with a flu-like illness, uh, you can still put your information in. And there actually is very early serology antibody testing available uh, for research purposes, and the blood bank will probably uh, be rolling that out very quickly in order to enroll people uh, in this study. So those of you who give blood, if you've had uh, the COVID, um, if you've had COVID in this coronavirus infection, your plasma donation can be life-saving for your brethren uh, in the hospital fighting for their lives. Uh, in terms of other antibody testing, um, has been, as I think uh, Supervisor Fletcher has already mentioned, the current, there, there's only one FDA-approved antibody rapid test on the market, and it's from an outfit in North Carolina, and that was just approved, uh, verified by the FDA last week. All of these other rapid antibody tests that are available on the market have not been FDA approved. The FDA has been somewhat permissive in allowing some limited use. However, there, there have been case reports from Texas and other areas that some of these tests are essentially worthless. Um, when we have a diagnostic test, we look at sensitivity, which is the test's ability to pick up uh, the virus or whatever it's testing for when it's actually present. And we look at specificity, which is the ability of the test to identify true negatives. The sensitivity and specificity thus far of several early marketed antibody tests has been dismal and there's a wide variation. And as I mentioned before, probably well under 5% of the San Diego population has had COVID up until this time. Therefore, that is a good uh, something good to point out. I'm sorry, Dr. Ifentides, we have run out of time for this segment, but I will continue to talk to you, and I do want to post some of this stuff online, so please stay with us, and thank you once again for joining us this evening. And that is all the time we have tonight. We want to once again thank Dr. Ethan Tidis and Supervisor Nathan Fletcher very much for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. And thanks to you as well for your questions. We're going to wrap up this special edition of News 8 next.
All right, over the past few weeks, we've been asking you to send the love to your friends and your family. Tonight, we'd like to return the favor. News 8 photojournalist John Steinbaugh sends the love to the people in San Diego that are making a difference in our lives. Is critical in our community. We're going to hand out 20,000 pounds of meat today. This is a war. This is a silent enemy. You know, that the healthcare workers and the first responders, that's what they're doing. Healthcare workers are in the trenches and they're out there and they're they're the closest to it at anybody, so we wanted to come out and say thank you. I busted out a sewing machine and taught myself how to sew overnight. It's the least I could do in such a scary time, you know. We just so happen to use this plastic for a part that we sell. It's more important right now to provide uh, healthcare workers the protection they need. If we are able to help just one person because of this, avoid getting the COVID-19, then we've done our job, we've done our work. We feel really grateful um, this outpouring of love for her. Uh, it was just an amazing experience.